every Sunday. Discovery Channel lets you explore deeper and go further than ever before. Every Sunday, one theme, three special stories, unlimited discoveries. Discovery Sunday, Sunday night on Discovery Channel. An old army saying, you need not to call a devil, he'll come without calling. Levi's going down. Merlin is straight up crazy. Wednesday. Levi called a meeting. This can't be good. The devil. Did you just hear what I said? John lied to me. Comes calling. Last person that betrayed Levi, we don't know what happened to him. If we're really going to do this, we've got to turn off our mics. Amish Mafia, all new Wednesday at 9 on Discovery. What the hell is that? Yes, you know exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about a subject that, at least from what I've seen, surprisingly doesn't get talked about more often. We're talking about what exactly happened to the Discovery Channel, and see how our once mostly respected educational channel has become yet another reality TV show channel that some people nowadays think is best left forgotten. In order to fully understand what exactly happened to the channel and how it has gotten to this point, we will have to travel back in time, to a time long before man. Back across 65 million years. Okay, maybe not that far back in time, but at least to the very beginning of the channel, during 1985, this was the same year that the return of Godzilla hit US theaters and when the very first windows came into existence. Just to give a bit of perspective. Anyways, it was on June 17th of 1985 when John Hendricks, the current founder of Curiosity Stream, founded Discovery Communications, which launched at around 3 p.m. of that day, to an audience of around 156,000 people around the U.S., which also made it the very first cable channel in history to provide high-quality documentary programming enabling people to explore your world and to satisfy their overall curiosity from the very comfort of their own living room or wherever they decide to watch TV and he didn't do this alone he had help from several investors including the BBC the Allen and Company and Venture America and what's more is that with its first initial launch 75% of the channel's content was stuff that was never initially broadcast in the US before which not only included nature science historical and cultural documentaries, but also apparently some Soviet programming as well, including Vremier, a Russian news program, so the channel was already breaking ground with a couple of firsts for its time. However, it wouldn't be until literally two years later when the channel would break even more ground with a television block that would eventually become an absolute staple of the channel. The Discovery Channel presents Shark Week. Bringing you face to face with this mysterious creature of the deep. Make the voyage with Shark Week. Next week on Discovery. Shark Week which was itself born out of a two-day brainstorming meeting at Hay Adams in Washington, D.C., and in the year 1989 in April, the channel had found a place in both Scandinavian and United Kingdom cable services. It was during the 1990s when things for Discovery Communications, as well as Discovery Channel itself, were becoming even bigger than before. In the year 1991, Discovery Communications had acquired the Learning Channel, also known as TLC for short, yes, before they changed it to Tender Loving Care, 
TLC was once known as the Learning Channel, anyways, before this acquisition, it was an Appalachian Community Service Channel set up by NASA, which I am not going to go into more detail as TLC's history would be for a whole other video, anyways. It was during this time when more and more very easily recognizable and arguably iconic programming would grace Discovery Channel's airwaves, including Wild Discovery. <laughs> Paleo World and the Ultimate Guide. And these shows were not alone, as the BBC partnership also meant that many BBC natural history documentaries also played on the Discovery Channel as well, including The Trials of Life, Supernatural, Not That Supernatural, This Supernatural, and The Life of Birds. The arrival of home video cassettes and video players into the market meant that now people who were big fans of some of these shows could buy copies to play and watch whenever they want to as well. In 1995, with the World Wide Web becoming a thing, Discovery.com was launched for those who wanted to keep tabs on show releases or view clips from their favorite shows, or even play online interactive games on the site as well. In the year 1996, the company also launched Animal Planet. Welcome to Animal Planet, the television channel devoted exclusively to our fascination with animals. As well as Discovery Kids, both channels probably deserving of their own videos, and admittedly two channels I also grew up with, it was also in 1996 when the Science Channel was also launched by Discovery, this was also the same year when the Discovery Channel stores opened across America in several more locations and even had a flagship store in Washington that, according to the website Pompeii C3, was also part museum, as it featured some fossil exhibits as well as a live ant colony and, Personally, I think that's kinda rad as hell. In 1997, which was also the same year when I was Stark snapped into existence, Animal Planet had its international release, with one of the most popular shows to grace not only that channel but also Discovery Kids and Discovery Channel proper, The Crocodile Hunter. Hi folks, it's time for the Croc Pop Quiz! Is the Crocodile Hunter the seventh Spice Girl? An evil nosed guy with a flannel hat? A fearless guy who rescues crocodiles and lives on Animal Planet? What is Animal Planet? That hairy planet next to Mercury? Your brother's fraternity? It's very own cable channel with lots of entertaining shows like the Crocodile Hunter? So how do you get to Animal Planet? Ask your dog? Call NASA? Check your listings for Animal Planet? Right again! Watch the Crocodile Hunter on Animal Planet every Sunday and Monday at 9 p.m. See you there. Now, I call the 2000s the golden years as, well, this was the channel zero that I grew up with, and one I have the most nostalgia for, but I am not here to pour out my life story, I am here to educate, at least for this video. In the year 2000 alone, two paleo documentaries absolutely smashed records, and contributed to one of the largest and defining genres of the channel, these documentaries, in particular, were Raising the Mammoth, which was about the discovery of a very well-preserved woolly mammoth carcass in the Siberian tundra, and was also the origin of the mammoth cube meme, and BBC's Walking with Dinosaurs, 
which was not only a smash hit on both UK and US airwaves, but was also a game changer, as since the documentary used revolutionary CGI graphics by Impossible Pictures as well as animatronics and puppetry by crawly creatures, it brought dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and marine reptiles to life in a more realistic sense, at least for the time, and the doc was formatted more like a typical nature documentary than your typical paleo doc. These two documentaries would open the doors wide open for a plethora of paleo docs to air and be produced by BBC in Discovery, including the rest of the Walking With series, When Dinosaurs Roamed America, What Killed the Mega Beasts, Dinosaur Planet, and even the Animal Planet special Jeff Corwin's Giant Monsters and the Discovery Kids show's prehistoric planet, also known as Walking With Dinosaurs Abridged, and Bonehead Detectives of the Paleo World. It was also during the early 2000s when more iconic shows would pop up on Discovery Channel, including Micro's Dirty Jobs and Mythbusters in 2003, with the former going in-depth about the many dirty careers and scientific studies out there and the science behind them, and the latter being about using science, chemistry, and physics to debunk various myths and half-truths out there, and the speculative evolution documentary Alien Planet in 2005 which explored the scientific possibilities of what life on other planets would be like with the example of Darwin IV, a fictional planet that was featured in Wayne Barlow's book Expedition. And Discovery Channel wasn't the only one showing very iconic edutainment either. Animal Planet garnered popularity with programming such as Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, Meerkat Manor, Prehistoric Park, and The Future is Wild. Discovery Kids also had a number of shows that proved to be pretty popular among viewers during this time as well, including Tutanstein, Kenny the Shark, Time Warp Trio, and Mystery Hunters to name but a few. Even with all these extremely popular educational shows, and Discovery becoming an overall household name with 1 billion subscribers in 2004, the sour future of the channel would ultimately begin to rear its ugly head with shows such as Monster Garage and American Chopper, shows that had little to no educational value and only showed off dudes with attitudes building and racing vehicles, and these shows were already being slammed by critics for straying from Discovery's original intent of educating their audience. Ah oh boy, here we go! As the late 2000s rolled by, eventually paving way for the 2010s, things were beginning to look pretty bad for the overall reputation of the channel, as in 2008, a great recession had occurred around the world, and with it, came the writer's strike, where 12,000 film and television screenwriters of the American Labor Union's Writers Guild of America protested due to not being paid their due by larger companies, the solution that many large companies had, was absolutely nothing. And nothing, if anything, was resolved, and instead, many television companies decided to cut corners, and push out easier to produce reality shows, which are programming that, as defined by the dictionary, are programs in which ordinary people are filmed on a continuous basis of their lives, many of these shows are scripted, and they're designed solely for entertainment value, rather than education and these would define the shows that would begin to more commonly pop up on Discovery Channel during this time, including shows such as Deadliest Catch, Naked and Afraid, Burring Sea Gold, Moonshiners, and Amish Mafia. The last documentaries that would be aired at all on the channel during this time would include BBC's Planet Earth and Life, Curiosity, The Controversial Dinosaur Revolution, and the infamous Clash of the Dinosaurs and Monsters Resurrected. It was very apparent that the changes done during the recession and the strike have caused the channel to fall victim to network decay, which had also affected the A&D owned history channel, as well as Discovery's own sister channel Animal Planet, which shifted from shows about animals to shows about law enforcement, exotic animal owners, hunting, rednecks, and everyone's favorite animals, tree houses and pools, all of these types of programs being shown under the new surprisingly human. And in 2010, Discovery Kids would become defunct as it was bought by Hasbro, with the last shows ever being aired on DK being the Future is Wild spin-off cartoon, 
growing up creepy, grossology, and dinosapien, and soon these would be replaced by the hub with, admittedly the best versions of Transformers and G.I. Joe, as well as the Lovecraftian phenomena known as. My little pony, my little pony. <laughs> Meanwhile, on Discovery Channel proper, Along with the plague of reality shows, more pseudoscience shows would also be produced for the channel, such as Mermaids The Body Found, which was basically trying to be a successor to the more comparatively educational Dragons A Fantasy Made Real, but failed since while Dragons focused more on the speculative natural history of their title animal with real life comparisons, Mermaids focused more on the very much disproven aquatic ape theory as well as the subplot that the American government was hiding mermaids, this caused thousands of people to harass Noah as Discovery didn't even bother to put a disclaimer saying the whole thing was horse crap, as well as the other pseudoscience show, Megalodon the Monster Shark Lives on Shark Week, which also didn't have a this is fake disclaimer, and decided instead to piggyback off of the very much debunked theory that Megalodon. The definitely extinct, at least thanks to the Ice Age and Great White Sharks, shark from the Miocene and Pliocene epochs, was somehow still alive in the oceans somewhere, despite various forms of fossil evidence saying otherwise, I would go into detail about the other controversies the channel did during this time, but that will instead be relegated to part 2 of this video. As of 2021, Discovery Channel proper still continues to push out reality shows and very questionable pseudoscience shows, despite their promise in 2015 to cut the bull crap. Allosaurus had never seen such bullshit before. Thanks to ratings, and this is honestly even more worrying than before, thanks to the overall increasingly growing trend of pseudoscience and anti-science throughout most of the US. Mostly thanks to certain factors. And since he left the company in 2014, John Hendricks has since moved on to found the streaming service Curiosity Stream, which, along with certain YouTube channels such as Edge, Thray the Explainer, and Animalogic, are the closest things we have to anything resembling what a modern Discovery Channel would be like if they didn't hop aboard the reality show train. In 2020, Discovery Channel aired one of the biggest middle fingers to the scientific community, which was Dinosaur Hunters, which is a show about a bunch of cattle ranchers digging up fossils for the highest bidders instead of any actual scientists or scientific research or establishment, Edge has already made a video about this, which I'll link in the description of this video because it'll take me all day to explain why this is bad, and I'm going to go into more detail about it anyway in the next video. As of 2021, Discovery also launched Discovery Plus, which is their own streaming service which is no doubt made to be a competitor for Disney Plus, and while I have heard claims that the service has brought back many of their older programmings on there, I don't have the service myself to deny or confirm these claims, but either way, I am taking the claims with a grain of salt anyway. This is not the only development for this year either as at and t, 
Discovery, and Warner Media are in the talks about a merger deal, which honestly doesn't bode well for me as I know it probably means junk shows and very little, if any documentaries or edutainment of any form, and what's more is that with cable inevitably becoming a dying platform, there's probably no chance for Discovery Channel to make any form of proper revival as an educational platform, and we might be seeing the last few throws of the channel as a whole. We're in the end game now. What makes this even worse is that the most recent Shark Week, at least what I heard, had celebrities host it as well as have a crossover with the show Jackass, which celebrity guest stars would not be such a big problem, but the most recent iterations of Shark Week, as many critics have pointed time and time again, focus less on educating people on sharks, and more on fear-mongering as well as entertainment, mainly of the game show type variety. What's more is that a second season of the fossil poaching reality show Dinosaur Hunters is in the works, or has already come out by the time this video gets out, and what's especially not helping is that many entertainment news outlets often praise many of these reality shows, and only once in a blue moon does Discovery really ever gets called out, meaning it's really up to those who still remember the educational days of Discovery, to really speak up about all of this. Whenever Discovery Communications ever decides to listen to criticism, While this video talked about the overall history of the Discovery Channel, the next video will go into detail about the many controversies the channel has gotten itself into, for the sake of farming ratings for overall money. Alright, a uh, quick disclaimer. I completely apologize for the computerized voice. I originally had voice acted most of the lines, but at one point the app I was using got got a virus and that all the voice files got corrupted. So, yeah, I apologize for that. I hope you all can understand ev everything I uh, put into this video, and hopefully the next one will be actually voice acted. So... Yeah, I apologize for all that.